class is um, a, a very gentle introduction into PCA. We, we, will, we will cover some mathematics, um, but we will also look at PCA from a very uh, picture point of view, basically uh, a geometric point of view. But then once we've illustrated it geometrically, we'll start to get into some mathematics. Whereas uh, the class last week was really just wasn't intended for you to understand latent variables um, in, any, in any depth, but more for you just to see what you can do. So if you recall last class we looked at using latent variable methods to learn more from a data set, how to troubleshoot the problem on a chemical process. So that example where the contribution plots help the engineers figure out it was the temperature on trade three in the distillation column that was the problem. So trouble process troubleshooting was one objective. Uh, process monitoring to see whether we're in control or out of control, are we producing good product or bad product. The fourth way in which we can use our, uh, these tools are for process prediction. Um, so soft sensors, being able to predict something that's really hard to measure. So for example, that example of the electronic nodes, where we use gas chromatography and other signals to predict something that a sensory panel of judges would have predicted for you. The judges are really expensive to bring to your plant and give them samples to taste. Can we replace them periodically by using uh, other, sense, other signals from our process? And then uh, finally, process optimization. So those are the broad objectives we're trying to achieve. In today's class, we're going to be focusing on that first one, how to learn more from a data set. And particularly in the last hour, where we're going to start to use the software, we're going to go through three data sets that you've never seen before, and we're going to learn quite a lot from those data sets just with a few simple graphs of the scores and the loadings from, from PCA. Okay, so, so that's where we're going in today's class. Um, and in between that, I'm going, to have, uh, I'm going to have you talk about the latent variables that you thought about last week. I'm going to have a few questions about the paper by Swansea World. So we'll, we'll, we'll break up the class with both of those things. So let's just quickly recap then. Um, what we're going to look at is this data table, or just another way of saying a matrix, X. And we have N observations or row in this, rows in this data table, and K columns. That's the standard notation you'll see throughout the course. And, and thankfully, in most of the journal articles, they use the same notation as well. Not, not always, but for the most part, N and K are the absolute X standard in, in the papers. So what goes in the columns? Can you give me an example, Lucero, of the data table you've looked at? What would you put in as in one of the columns? So let's say that the temperature concentration on certain variables in the Temperature concentration on on certain variables. And what would those variables be in the rows that you would consider? Okay, so time samples in the rows, and, and you're obviously talking about a chemical point. Yeah. Okay. Who's doing experimental work in the lab? Lily? I guess you are at Xerox. So what would your rows be? Uh, different, uh, different runs. Different runs from your experiments, and the types of columns, variables you'll be measuring? Uh, concentrations, uh, concentrations, uh, the chemical constituents added to your runs. Yeah, so I guess you're, you're adding ingredients in a, in a recipe or ratio, so those could go, how much of a certain ingredient you added would be a good, good measure. So the key thing here is whatever goes in the row, within that row, it's consistent. It's all that data belongs to one experiment, or it's all the data from your plant at one point in time, okay? Or it's, if I'm dealing, say, the, uh, as a bank, and I'm, I'm looking at my customers, every row would be one particular customer and the columns would be properties of those customers. So whether that customer had opened their bank account for a certain period of time, how many bank accounts they had opened with us, and various attributes of that person. Okay, so the rows are something that's consistent within each other. So let's say you've got a data table, 300 rows and 50 columns, a pretty small data table. Before you even do any sort of analysis on it, one of the first things we'd like to do is to plot the data. Okay, and as homework last week, I asked you to look at the visualization slides I gave you. We didn't have a chance to cover visualization in class, but it is a concept that is important for this course and for any um, statistics course. So I'm kind of assuming it's a prerequisite, 
and that's why I put the slides there for you to read on your own time. So based on those notes or your own experience, um, yeah, so tell me, for example, how you would start to look at a data table with 300 rows and 50 columns. What would you start to do? Are we going to have like time as a variable or? Uh, let's say down the rows, sure. Okay, I mean, if you have time as a variable, you can have a time series plot or, or, or scattered plot, like so in order to kind of like, I don't know, like how they that change like a hundred different variables. Okay, so a time series plot for every row or column? For every, uh, yeah, it could be for every one, for every column, maybe I put it to one row, like as time as a variable. Okay. I mean, as time as an object, and uh, maybe a scattered plot can show like, like different, for example, if you have like a group of a group of measurements which are related together, you can see them in effect to a certain object or a so a scatter plot of any two columns or could be like two columns and one row, for example, or like well, so uh, actually a scatter plot would be um, so you take any two rows from that matrix, or any two columns from that matrix rather, and plot those two as a scatter plot x, one on the x axis, one on the y axis. Yeah. Okay. And what sort of things would you be looking for in that scatter plot? Uh, can you find how the variables are Okay. And coming back to your time series example, what sort of things would you be looking for in the time series? How does that change over time? So. Like uh, the kind, the kind, it depends on the type of variable, but I mean, you can say like uh, things are changing with time, increasing with time, or decreasing with time, or okay. Good. So, for example, coming back, if you're plotting, let's say a particular column, this is your time direction goes down the matrix. We'd be looking at trends. Does this variable go drift up? Does it drift down? Are there oscillations in it? Does it do that sort of pattern? You'd be, our, our, our human eye is very is extremely powerful at picking up patterns. You would not be surprised how easy it is for us to see patterns in, in a picture. But for a computer, those patterns are, are nothing, right? A computer cannot tell that there's oscillations in a plot. But if I show you a plot, you can very quickly see that. Okay, well, so. The other thing we can have is maybe a bird plot would work. I mean, I think like the, the, the rules would be like the objects, and for each object we have one lot few variables, yeah. Okay. Perfect, yeah, like a histogram or a, 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 a particular column. Okay, great. So those are all, uh, all valid examples, but as you can see, how, how many scatter plots would you have for the case when k is equal to 30? Yes, how many? 30. 30? 30 scatter plots? Oh, well, let's take, let's take the case of, of three variables. Okay, so case one. X2, X3. How many scatter plot pairs are there? Six. It's X1 versus X2, X2 versus X3, and X1 versus X3. There's three scatter plots. Okay, so for the case when K is equal to three. In general, you can show that you need to plot K times K minus one divided by two scatter plots to see every single combination. But for k is equal to 50, that's a little order of that many scatter plots. So there's no way you can spend your time on a small data set, k is equal to 50, is not bigger by any means, using the scatter plot. It's great for k approximately 6 to 10, but after 10, you really um, don't have against a large number of scatter plots to generate. You probably cannot fit them all in if you don't want to go on the screen. So these tools that, you, that we've discussed here are excellent visualization tools for a small number of variables. That's the key point. <coughs> you plot one column at a time, time series, histograms, box plots. Those sorts of univariate visualization tools are excellent for one variable or for a small number of variables. Okay? So you can easily generate them in MATLAB or Excel in a, usually a fairly automated way. <clears throat> um, we looked last class at, at spectral data where your y-axis is some sort of absorbance and then you've got wavelengths plotted over here and you get some sort of response coming over there as a function of the wavelength number. 
we usually when we record this data actually in our matrix we have um, sample one sample two sample three etc and along our columns we store those wavelengths so that those are the wavelengths and there could be many hundreds of them for that particular sample that records this spectral response for sample one we have the same, a different spectral response for sample two. So here we're plotting every row at a time using that sort of uh, time, it's not a time series plot, but it's a, it's a line plot, that's what it's called. So now our y, our x-axis plot is not time, but wavelength. So any sort of these standard visualization tools are great for a small number of columns or rows. Okay? And that's the key thing, a small number. So Today's class, what we're going to be looking at is PCA. How do we take a big matrix, X, many columns, and compress it down to a small number, A, okay? Once we have this small number of scores, capital T, then we will use these same tools we just spoke about. We will use time series plots on the scores, time series uh, histi uh, histograms of the scores, box plots of the scores, perhaps, um, and we can plot scatter plots of the scores because now we've got a reduction from capital K down to a smaller number, capital A, and then we go ahead and use these same tools that we, we know and love and are very comfortable using. What is the number of A's? Okay, so capital A, how many how many columns can we reduce this down to? That's a topic we'll cover after the break, okay? And it's, it's good because we're going to, and, and, and especially we'll cover it next class. We'll, we'll learn algorithms to calculate what the capital A should be. In today's class, we're going to learn how much of the information is in X is captured in T. Okay? And in the next class, we're going to say, when should we stop adding columns? Because what we'll see in today's class, we're going to build the first column then add a second column, add a third column, keep adding columns. At some point we have to stop, like you say, how many columns do we do there? We'll, we'll cover that in a bit in today's class, but mostly in these class. Okay. So the picture I want you to have in your head is as follows. We're going to take a matrix X, N rows or N, N samples, and K columns. We're going to find two new matrices that approximate capital X. Okay, that's all that PCA does, is it takes X and it breaks it down into two parts. It scores T, okay? So notice that the number of rows in capital T is the same as we have in our original matrix. So let's take, for example, this first column from T, and I'm going to introduce some new notation here. So let this be capital T, and there's my first column in T, okay. and we'll call that T1, this is a vector, T1, and the first row corresponds to sample 1, or row 1, okay. and we'll call this T1, comma 1, so row 1, column one in the score matrix. And for our second row, we'll have T2, comma one, our third row, T3, one, up till the end, T capital N, comma one. So, these N rows in one column summarize these N values are a summary of the n original rows in x. Sorry. Yeah. So this single number over here, t11, is a summary of the entire first row in x. So we've summarized all of x with one single number. The first row of x with one number. Our second row in x, we summarize that in another number, t2. And so all the way to the bottom. So that after we've calculated the first component, Tn, we've calculated a summary of x that now happens to just be a single column, one summary value for every row. Okay. How we do that and, and how we 
find this number, and how much information is contained in that number is something we're going to look at in today's class. Okay? We're summarizing this, but we, we are, of course, not going to be able to summarize that entire row with one number and capture all the information from that row with one number, of course. Not. So what we then go do is we go add a second column onto T that will add to our knowledge. So we add a second column called T2 now, okay? also a vector, and same notation. So this first row in T2 is T2, uh, T1 subscript 2, T2, 2, T3, 2, all the way till the end, Tn. And so each of these scalars in the second column, there's n of them, build up to create T2. Okay, back to T2. And so on. And we can we proceed adding components. In other words, a new column onto T. We can add a T3 column, a T4, and we'll stop adding up to TA. We'll, like I said, we'll discuss how to stop adding them. So I just want you to be comfortable with this notation first. Any questions on that so far? Okay, basic uh, matrix algebra notation. Let's take a look at this other matrix P, capital P, which we'll call the loadings. And I'm going to draw P diagram should be P transpose. So if you can just update your, your notes, so that should be P transpose. This matrix in this format is P, and they are K rows and A columns. So take this matrix, which had K columns here. This matrix should be P transpose. Please update your notes. I'm going to untranspose it. So this now is P. Okay. And the same notation. That first row entry in P is P11. The second entry in P in that first column is P21. P31 up to P capital K1. So in this illustration, I've, it's that first row <coughs> transposed now becomes the first column over here. So notice we've got one loading value for every variable, for every column in our original X matrix, capital K. Yes, we'll, it is a projection matrix, so we'll, we'll go into the math. Okay. So the first component, then, is given by a T1 vector, which is a long column like that with N entries, up to one, up to capital N. And the first component also has a loading vector, P1. So I'll draw it like this. Um, P1 transpose. That's taking this first column okay, from capital P. And because I've transposed it now here, it, it lies horizontally. First entry is 1, 2, up to capital K. And the reason why I'm making a bit, a bit of a deal here about transpose is that in general when we refer to vectors, T1, we usually assume that that vector is always a column vector. If I want to be a, a, a row vector, I'll always add the transpose on at the end. So P1 is actually a column with K entries here. P1 transpose then is a row vector with K columns. So that's the notation I want you to, to, to have in mind. We're going to use that for throughout this class today. So uh, I think I've covered this. We're going to cover, at least initially, the intuitive meaning of the scores, at least this capital T matrix. Then we're going to also look at, at the loadings. And in addition, we'll look at the errors. Okay, so I said here that this T1 these T values capture and summarize that row in X, but obviously there's some error. You can't capture the entire 
amount of information that grows. There's going to be some residual error. We'll look at what those means. We'll interpret every one of these, the T's, the P's, and the errors. And we'll do several examples at the end of the class and so on. So I've covered this notation. One final piece of notation I should introduce here is the length of the vector. Okay, so I'm, I'm really sorry for those of you that you're all comfortable with this mathematics, but I, I know there's always a few people that are not quite at the same level, so I just want to bring everyone up to the same level of math. So when you see this notation for a vector A, so A is a vector, it means we take the entries in that vector A, A1, let's say, squared plus A2 squared and let's say there's n elements in, in vector a, and a squared, squared root. So it's nothing more than the, the length of that vector is what it's saying. Okay. Now, before we go into drawing some pictures on the board and understanding what PCA is intuitively, I need to just mention this part on data preprocessing because I know that if I don't do it now and I try to interpret it later on and then we come to pre-processing, you're going to say, well, how does this fit into the whole picture? So what I do want to cover is data pre-processing and, and uh, just some notation thing on that. Okay. And to do that, I'm going to do it with a, with a <coughs> tiny example that we'll cover later on in today's class. Scatter plot matrix, five variables, okay? And you said, k times k minus 1 divided by 2 scatter plot, so that's 5 times 4 divided by 2 is 10. Okay, and that's these 10 scatter plots in the upper triangle. The 10 scatter plots in the bottom triangle are just a mirror image put off the top of the upper triangle. Along the diagonal for these five variables, we illustrate the histogram of that variable. So this oil variable Pretty normally distributed density as well. Crispiness seems to have a bimodal bump there. Fracture normally distributed. Hardness normally distributed. Okay. These five variables capture the texture and properties of 50 different pastries. Okay. So I've got a data set where someone's measured these 50 properties: oiliness, density, crispiness, fracture durability, where they bend it and, and the pastry snaps. But what level does it fracture and, and hardness? Okay. And we've got 50 rows in that data set. So along the diagonal, you can see the individual properties as a histogram for that variable. If you plot oiliness versus density, you get a scatter plot, and those two variables are negatively correlated. The more oily the, de or oily the pastry is, the lower the density. So that, that negative negative relationship there between oily and density. Um, there's a slight positive correlation between oiliness and crispiness. So the more oily the pastry, the, the more crispy it is. Okay? And let's took, take a look at the relationship between crispy and fracturability. So the more crispy a pastry is, the, the lower the point at which it fractures. And there's really no relationship here between these two variables. There's, and, and for that matter, these two variables. So crispiness on this axis and hardness on this axis, those points are pretty much scattered all over. There's no real relationship that we can describe between crispiness and hardness. Okay, so scatter plot matrix is actually extremely informative for a small number of variables. You can get a lot of information from but that's not why I have this data table up here. Um, we will look at this data set later on in the today, so that's a good intro to it. But what I do want to look at is the individual variables and what, what pre-processing will do to this data set. So let's take a look first at this box plot. There's the five variables, and I've plotted the box plot for each of them. So for the oily, oily variables, you see that that box plot is so compressed here on the scale of 0 to 3,000, my oiliness values are all, all down here. Let's quickly go back to the scatter plot matrix. I hope you have the units in your, uh, or you can at least see them in your slides. But here you can see the numbers range between 14 and 20 on the oiliness scale. Okay. 
that's the total range of the oiliness variable. The density variable ranges between 2,600 and 3,200, which is why on the box plot for density, we have those numbers up here. Crispiness and fracture and hardness, these, three uh, these four variables all down here have very narrow ranges of their, of their values. But density has, a, has high values. So what mean centering does, geometrically, is to shift all these box plots down so that the mean is at zero. Mean centering, mathematically, takes the column from x, so here's our matrix x, let's just take any particular column, so x subscript k, we'll take the lower, lower k, uh, k column from x. Mean centering says calculate the mean of that column and in another copy of this matrix here on the side, so I'll call this x raw, and here I'll call this x centered. Replace this column from x raw, put the numbers in here where you say xk1 minus x, x bar. So here I take xk bar, and I sub so I subtract that mean of this column. I take over to my next row in x, so here's xk2 minus that same mean. <coughs> so I simply subtract from the entries in this column the mean of that column. And afterwards you can show that if I recalculate the mean of this column over here, that will have a mean of zero. So it's pretty simple. Just calculate the mean of, of that single column subtracted and put the new values in a duplicate copy of the matrix. You repeat for every column. So after centering, if I go and calculate the mean of this entire matrix, let's say I do this in MATLAB or Excel, I just go say calculate for me the mean of that all, all those columns, I'll just get a vector of zeros here. One zero for every column. Mean centering just simply subtracts the mean. And that makes sense, right? If you think about it on a chemical plant, let's say I measure a temperature in Kelvin, or I mention, uh, measure it in Celsius. What, and it's the same variable. And let's say my values in Celsius range between 0 and 100. In Kelvin, they'll just range between 273 and 373. But there's really no difference. I've just arbitrarily added 273 onto that one, onto my Kelvin measurements. Okay. So all that mean centering will do is it just brings those two variables into alignment. And it, it removes the arbitrary biases and offsets that are sometimes added to measurements. Okay. So mean centering doesn't destroy any information in your data set, doesn't remove anything. It just subtracts out usually something we already know. Okay. And, and just brings our numbers all between plus and minus uh, around zero. Okay. So that means second. Scaling does the next step. So notice here, when after, after mean centering, so that center point now is at zero, but the, the variables have a different range. Every variable in our column, has a, some have a bigger range, some have a smaller range. So you can imagine if you had a sensor on a chemical plant on a control loop, that control loop is very well controlled and it should have no variability because it's under feedback control. It behaves very stably with very little movement. Another variable, let's say it's the input of, to your process and you're accepting raw materials from all over, let's say on a steel mill, you're accepting scrap of varying quality. That variable, that input is changing all the time. It's going to have a huge variability. So some variables, just naturally will have a small variation, other variables will have really large variation. And that's a problem. If we go and apply PCA just to this, all that PCA will do is will explain that variable. Why is that? Because the majority of variances both have one variable and the other ones aren't uh, scaled appropriately. Right. 
So if you don't go scale, any variable that has high variability will get the most uh, information uh, or extracted out of the PCA. And that uh, comes simply from this explanation here. PCA says, find me the best summary of my data. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll learn as we proceed here that when we say best summary, it's explaining variance. So all that PCA does is it explains variance. If you've got columns here that have high variance, they'll be explained the most. The columns with very little variance have nothing to explain, or very little to explain. Okay. So with, if we have no prior or better judgment, centering just simply removes us to, removes us to zero, but scaling brings us all to equal footing. So it will shrink this variable down and will expand that variable up, that's with low variance, so that after, after scaling, we end up with variables that are at zero and have a standard deviation of one. Okay. Now those box plots don't line up exactly at zero. Okay. Why is that, Jake? Uh, because they're the medians? Those are the medians, they're not the mean. Okay. So if we did median centering, those numbers would all line up exactly at zero. These, by the way, what's that upper limit on the box plot? Anyone? Shall we? 75th and the 25th percentile. So those two numbers give us a measure of spread in the data set. Okay. And again, these variables don't line up exactly because they're not perfectly normally distributed. But I will just mention for now, and we'll prove it later on. After centering, you calculate your mean, it's a vector of zeros. If you go calculate your standard deviation after scaling, that standard deviation will all be one. One, 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 one. So, we'll, uh, so it's up here. To center your data, you take your x raw, you subtract the mean of the k column, and you get a new vector xk centered. That's centering. Then we go and scale after centering. So we take our x centered and we divide through by the standard deviation, x centered. And this new variable x, cap, x subscript k, if we go calculate the mean of that, xk, it will be, what will the mean of xk be after we've centered, after we've scaled, sorry? Zero, right? Because the mean doesn't change when you, when you divide through by this denominator. This denominator is just a, a scalar, right? The standard deviation of a column is just a scalar number. The mean of a vector doesn't change if you multiply or divide it through by a scalar. Okay, so the mean of xk is zero, the standard deviation of xk is one. Okay, so every column after centering and scaling will have mean of zero and will have standard deviation of one. And I'll, I'll put this out here, mean centering and scaling does not change the relationship between the variables. What I mean by that is, um, unfortunately I, sh I don't have it yet and it would be really nice to is to show what this scatter plot matrix looks like after centering and scaling. But after centering and scaling, these variables will still have the negative correlation with each other. It's just the range over that box won't be the arbitrary units we've measured them in, but now will be numbers that range roughly from minus four to plus four. Okay. After centering and scaling, most variables will range between minus three and plus three. If you've got a few extreme points, minus four to plus four. If you've got extreme outliers in that, in that column originally, then these low bounds and upper bounds could be anything. Right? It could be very large or very small numbers. But in general, for a well-behaved variable with no outliers, after centering and scaling, your mean is equal to zero, the standard deviation is one, and your range is about plus or minus four. And the relationships between the individual variables have, haven't changed at all. Okay. Any questions on, on what centering and scaling is doing? Yeah. So when we do these centering and scaling, So yeah, good 
question. So that's asking after we sent it and scaled, we've done PCA, do we have to undo that? Um, generally, yes, we will. PCA model will work on the centered and scaled data. We will never do PCA on the raw data we, we collect. So for example, this data, I wouldn't do PCA on that for the reason I mentioned earlier. That there's this density variable here that's got a huge variation compared to the oil variation. PCA will just focus on that density variable. So I center and scale first, remove this arbitrary scaling that we just had for example, I could have measured that this variable in kilograms versus grams. That's an arbitrary decision I've made, but the one will inflate the variance by a factor of a thousand, and the other won't. So centering and scaling removes those, then we apply PCA on the centered and scaled data, and when we want to come back, it's helpful to see the results back in real world units. You don't have to, but it's easier for us, especially if you're sharing the, the results with your colleagues who are familiar with these variables back in the original unit. There's no sense in trying to work um, in centered and scaled units. But the software will work in centered and scaled units, convert the graphs back to your real world units afterwards. Okay. So let's take a look at that, what, that, uh, what centering and scaling does from a geometric point of view. I take my data, and all these plots I'll, I'll work in three dimensions. So. Uh, just to be clear then, what I'm doing here is I'm taking my, my data set X and I'm saying I've got three columns, X1, X2, and X3. And that's purely so that I can illustrate it for you on the board. It's not that uh, it, it holds, this result that we see here holds for higher dimensions. Uh, but to illustrate it, we'll look at it in, in this way for three columns. So every data point Oh, every point in this picture represents a row in my original X matrix, and I've got 20 odd rows here, for example. I calculate the mean, and it, the mean then represents a new, back, a new point here. So basically, that's X1 mean, X2 mean, X3 mean. So I can take that point, x1, x2, x3 bar, and plot it as well. Okay, so that purple point is not a real data point, it's just the mean, and it, it falls in the middle of my, my, my cloud, or my swarm. Okay. So after centering, what that happens then, that point falls exactly at the origin of my, my coordinate system, x1, x2, x3, and that cloud just moves. It doesn't change its shape, it just shifts <coughs> to that new location. Okay. Scaling, I don't have an illustration here, but all that scaling would do is it would make the perspective from X1's point of view, X2's point of view, and X3's point of view look have to have the same range. So it will stretch and shrink this cloud so that when you look at the data from X1's perspective or X2's perspective, or along the X3 axis, it will have the same variability of about plus or minus four. But the relationship between, the shape of the overall cloud won't change, and the relationship between the points won't change. Okay. So PCA operates on this data. It doesn't operate on the raw data you've measured. It's like normal, Normal, yeah, so you've done data mining, you, 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 you've probably seen this before, standardization or normalization of the data. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, so this is a common statistical pre-processing step is to center and scale the data. Um, and we do this, for example, when we look at design experiments, or any sort of uh, data analysis will often do this ahead of time. You can do this to least squares, and then you build your least squared model on center and scale data. Any mathematical model you build, you can first center and scale data. Is that anything of this, No, no. This is for well-behaved data that's roughly normally distributed. This is just a rule of thumb. But for example, if I have a column here in X, and I've got a huge outlier, okay? So this is a good question here. What, what will happen for, for the case of outliers. Let's take the case of X1 
and I plot it as Yasser said at the start of the class, we plot this in time order. Okay. And let's say x1 behaves like this, it's kind of an oscillatory trend, but then I've got a point right up there. Okay. And then continues. Let that point might be due to a sensor malfunction, some other problem has happened. This line over here represents the mean of the data ignoring that point. If I calculate the mean with that point included, it's going to be shift, it's going to be pulled up by that point. So when I mean sensor and then scale, my data is not going to follow that, this, that distribution of, of, or not obey this rule of thumb of plus or minus four. Okay? But for well-behaved columns with no outliers, that's just a rule of thumb that you can, you can use. Perfect, yeah. But most software will always mean center. Median centering would be more. So the rate of the R score is on a well behaved way. Oh, does it affect the changes in the situation? No, in general. Uh, because what normalization does is it's, it's creating a standardized variable that should be for well behaved, normally redistributed data. Remember, the normal distribution ranges between minus 3 and plus 3, captures 99.7%. Plus and minus four on the normal distribution catches most of the range. So that's where that, that number is. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to just go ahead. I normally would break here now, but I just want to go for about another 10 minutes to get to a point where we can then break. Explain what PCA is doing from the, just continuing on with these plots. So the first component in PCA finds a vector, drawn here by the orange line, that passes through the center point of our coordinate system. And the orientation of that vector is such that it goes in the direction of greatest variance. Okay, so that's a, that's a whole mouthful. So let's break that down. So this orange line is a vector, and it's a vector in a three-dimensional space. This is our loading, P1. Why is that? Let's uh, quickly redraw that figure we had earlier. At the start of the class, we said we're going to take a matrix X, and we're going to go down to a vector T1, and P1 transpose. So this is our loading. So we're in a one, two, three-dimensional space over here. So it makes sense that P1 is a one, two, three dimensional vector. Okay? There's three entries in, in P1. P1 is a vector. T1 is also a vector. So P1 is a vector in this three dimensional space. And the algorithm proceeds as follows. It says I must, the vector must start at the origin. And the algorithm just goes and moves this vector around in three dimensional space until it finds the position in the space that goes along the greatest direction of variation. Okay. And we'll explain that as alternatively as it finds the direction that best explains the data. Now, there's that word best again, and remember I said in the last class, whenever you hear the word best, you know that there's an optimization problem somewhere. So it finds this direction that best explains the data, and best here means minimum error. Okay. So all those things are equivalent. Minimum error, direction of greatest variance, best explains the data. All those three things mean exactly the same for PCA. So this direction goes in the, in the uh, direction of greatest variance. And there's only one direction that does that. The moment I move this vector even slightly to the left or the right or up or down or in and out of the board, it explains less variation. There's only one unique direction always in the space that goes in that direction. Okay. So that's our loading. That those three entries define this direction in a three-dimensional space. The next part we need to look at is what is t. Okay, so t is, a, t is as follows. For every row, 
we need to calculate the corresponding t value, right? Okay. So every row needs its own t value. What is t value? Let's assume this blue point over here is the first observation in x. That first row in x represents its x1, its x2, and its x3 location. So I find this point, x11, x12, x13, and those three values define the location of that blue point. T1 represents the distance along this orange line when I project <laughs> when I project this blue point onto that orange line perpendicularly. So at 90 degrees I project this blue point onto that orange line. That distance from the origin to the point at which the, that projection falls is T1 for that first row. Sorry? It's the dot product, yeah. We'll, we'll look at that after the break. Okay. So there's a, there's a picture of it. Project at 90 degrees to the orange line. The distance from the origin to where that green point, point meets is T1 for that, for that particular row in X. Then I go to my next row, X21, X22, X23, let's say. And let's assume that second point is this one over here, this blue point. Project out at 90 degrees. This value here, that distance from the origin to there, is the T1 value for the second row. And the T1 value, we can, we can choose this arbitrarily, will be negative. And the T1 values that land along the line from this side will be positive T1 values. T1 values that lie from that purple point down to this side are negative. Doesn't matter which way around you choose it, um, as long as you're consistent. Okay. The software will take care of that for you as well. So this first point over here, that distance thing is T1, 1, this will be T2, 1. Okay. So the second subscript refers to the fact that we're dealing with the first component. The first subscript refers to just the low entry. Yes? There's a good question in my concern with pre-processing. You said that you have an outlier then after the range and the like meaning might be just red. So should we actually like before before like before getting that then should we actually remove the outlier or we need it because we need variance like for the PCA? Okay, yeah. So the question is should we remove uh, so it's going back to pre-processing. Do we remove outliers prior to doing PCA or or do we let them affect our PCA model? Okay. Coming back to that example we had earlier, if you've got 30 columns, you, you don't have the time after to plot every single variable individually and see the outliers, so, especially on a big data set. So very often, if it's, if it's a huge data set, I'll just put it in, do PCA, and I'll let PCA find the outliers, remove them, and we build the model. Okay. The reason why I'm smiling is because that, that from the wall article uh, that you read, we'll, I'll show that as well. we'll cover that again. Okay, so let's come back here to PCA for the first component. Projections along this line are positive T values. Projections onto that line represent the distance along the orange line, and those are by convention negative on the other side. So that's the first component. We've calculated this T1 vector, T11, T21. For every single data point, we go and project it orthogonally onto this line, find that distance, and generate the t vector. The p vector is calculated um, by the software. We will come back to that next class, I promise. I know every class I say we'll look at it soon. Next class, we'll look at how that p is actually calculated. Um, and let's just say the software finds this direction for you of greatest variance. But once you have that, that direction, the t's are then calculated as the distances. OK, first component. Second component then does the following. Yes, we want, we want. Yeah. Um, because we've sent our data, the origin is the natural reference point. If I didn't send the data, and let's say my, my cloud is all up here, all my values would just be large positive numbers. So that's that's why we do centering at the time. Okay. But it's also because vectors by definition 
start at the origin and go to the point. So that that becomes our central reference point. There was there was no, it's just it's just the convention for where we pull our reference point. We could pick any reference point, but the origin is makes that sense. Yeah. Okay. Two, two points as to that. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Good question. So, can the question is can any two points have the same t value? Richard, yes or no? So let's go back to the previous slide. Can you add? Any two points have the same T1 value? Magnitude or value? Sorry? Magnitude or value? The same T1 value. So let's say I've got a row up here, and I've got a row up here, T23. Is it, is there, is it why or why not can these two rows totally unrelated, happen to have the same T1 value. Can they or can't they? How many people say they can and cannot? Okay, so someone who says they can, why? Well, because your individual point in space can still have the same total direction or distance. It's right, your distance is yours. And so it could be... That would, which, yeah, that Richard, you were probably going to say it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yes, perfect. So any points, like, let's say that's a good point, it's not drawn properly, but they could land coincidentally over there. Um, but they have the same T1 value, but then they may not have the same T2 and T3 value, which we're going to look at next. Yeah. But then they, like, you would basically say that the linear combination of their, of their loading curve, the actual value, would result in the same. Yeah, and we'll look at that after the break. Why? I mean, a linear combination is is has that ambiguity. We can always get the same value from the linear combination for different raw data. So we'll see that afterwards. Okay. Is this procedure is similar to least square analysis? Yeah. <laughs> for those of you that are seeing least squares in here, you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, the way the algorithm calculates it is by least squares, which is going to be your homework for today to review the least squares algorithm. In the next class, when we look at it, we need to understand what least squares is doing underneath here. So, yes, there's least squares underneath here. Okay, let's take a look at what T2 is and then we'll break. So, the second component simply says once I found this first direction, I need to go find a second direction. And I add a constraint. So, those people that do optimization, you know where this is going, there's now a constraint added here. The constraint is the second component needs to be orthogonal or perpendicular to the first component. So let's see what the algorithm does. It finds its first direction, grace varies. It knows then that the second component can be anywhere in a circular rotation around that first component, but orthogonal to the first. So the algorithm just simply takes this vector, rotates it around, hunting for the direction that gives it the best possible explanation of the rest of the data. Okay. So that it finds this direction orthogonal to the first component that then goes in, in the greatest direction of variance orthogonal to the first. Okay. Why? Because all PCA is saying, why? the question is why is P2, uh, the second component P2 doing that? Because the objective of PCA is to best explain the data, or best explain the variation of data. So it finds the first direction. Once it's found that, it's not explaining everything. There's some more variation in the data left over. So it goes and finds the next direction of greatest variance, and then the third direction of greatest variance. We keep adding direction of variance. Yeah, we're all Yes, okay, so Shafali is remarking here that all this is doing is we're really just changing the coordinate system, and that's absolutely correct. We're reorienting the coordinate system, x1, x2, x3, into a new coordinate system, t given by p1, p2, p3. Okay. So that's a, that's a good geometric insight there. Uh, so that second component, it finds it orthogonal to the first component, but such that it also goes in the direction of greatest variance. Then we go do exactly the same as before. We now go project every single point onto this second orange line 
and by convention, we'll say points that are to this side are positive T2 values, points on this side are negative T2 values. And you can see that illustrated here in the next slide. So project this point over here, it will have a, 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 a large negative T2 value. This point over here, if I project it along, will have negative T2 value, but not as negative as this point over here. This point back here, if I project it onto the, onto the line, will have a T2 value of roughly zero. And then this point over here, if I project it onto the line, will have a large positive T2 value. So every point then gets projected onto the second component. What I can go do after that um, is just add to this diagram here. We've now found vector P2. <coughs> So P2 is the vector that defines the second orange line, and it has three numbers in it to define the vector in three-dimensional space. We need those three numbers. So we'll talk a bit about how the software finds those numbers next class. But then T2 is a vector with n, n entries. T2 is a vector. And we go find T21, T22, T32, and so on up to T capital. So every one of our endpoints in the original data set is projected onto the second direction, and we calculate the corresponding distance that forms the T2 value. Okay. So let's take a break for that.